Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, a keynote presentation, Tracking the Resistome in One Health Surveillance. It is presented by Patrick McDermott, PhD, Director of the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System at the Office of Research in the Center for Veterinary Medicine at the FDA. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want anytime you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen, and click on the Send button. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the Ask a Question box to let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McDermott. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. It's a privilege to be participating in this conference uh, remotely um, and to take advantage of the opportunity LabRoots provides for researchers in the field to share some of the latest updates on their work um, and, and including in that, of course, some of the pu public health activities that I wanna talk to you about today um, in, in my presentation on tracking the resistome and one health surveillance. So um, let us begin then. The resistome, we're talking, of course, ab about a major public health challenge facing the world today, which is antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance. And it's an issue that's long been recognized as an impending difficulty and is now ranked among the top three threats to global health. Um, and, and it's a widespread problem. It's a, and, and this slide just happens to show some of the um, popular press and, and articles from scientific journals and others um, showing the scope of the problem, ranging in everything from untreatable cases of drug-resistant tuberculosis, for example, where uh, the last resort is, is, is reductive lung surgery in cases where antibiotics are, are completely impotent because of multidrug resistance. There are menacing cases of Neisseria gonorrhea in the U.S. and around the world that have become not only resistant to antibiotics, but more invasive and pathogenic. And so across the scope of, of the public health sector and around the world it is an issue and a problem to various degrees, but one that's growing and in, in, in is growing internationally and has to be addressed in an international manner. And, and part of the way in which that done is, is through the surveillance system. And I think it's, it's true to say that the consensus is fairly universal that in order to combat antibiotic resistance, we need to combat it in every environment in which antibiotics are used and to assure that those those uses are are appropriate and prudent and and tailored to specific pathogens and optimized, if you will, uh, in the best way so that we preserve antibiotics for future generations. And most of us don't have a full appreciation of how things have changed. And I think it's useful to think back for just a moment. And, and I have a quote here uh, from Lewis Thomas uh, when he describes the early days of antibiotics in what, it, what has been called the golden age of antibiotics uh, and the impact it had on practitioners at the time. And this is an excerpt from one of his uh, books in the early 80s. And he says, for most of the infectious diseases, there was nothing that could be done beyond bed rest and good nursing care. Then came the explosive news of sulfonilamide and the start of the real revolution in medicine. I remember the astonishment when the first case of pneumococcal and streptococcal septicemia were treated in Boston in 1937. The phenomenon was almost beyond belief. Here were morbid patients who would surely have died without treatment, improving within a matter of hours, feeling entirely well within the next day. We became convinced overnight that nothing lay beyond the reach of, of the future medicine was off and running. So you get a sense from the, the tone of this, just what a revolution these medicines were when they became 
uh, when it became possible to use them in large populations and treat uh, what had previously uh, been untreatable diseases. Now, here's a, another quote from Margaret Chan, the WHO, recent WHO director to the G7 health ministers in 2015 that shows by contrast uh, where we've come since 1937. The rise of antimicrobial resistance is a global health crisis, she says. Medicine is losing more and more mainstay, mainstay antimicrobials as pathogens develop resistance. Second line treatments are less effective, more costly, more toxic, and sometimes extremely difficult to administer. Many are also in short supply. Superbugs haunt hospitals and intensive care units all over the world. With few replacement products in the pipeline, the world is heading toward a post-antibiotic era in which common infections will once again kill. So you can get a sense of how we've come so far after many decades of widespread antibiotic use in human and veterinary medicine and the sense of urgency that this has placed upon governments around the globe to try to grapple with this problem. And the World Health Organization is leading, spearheading this through their global action plan, which outlines a number of elements that countries should incorporate into national strategies to combat antibiotic resistant bacteria. The United States has such a plan as well that was um, published in March of 2015, where it says the U.S. will work domestically and internationally to prevent, detect, and control illness and death related to infections caused by resistant bacteria. And it has five major goals in it. And these are to slow the emergence of resistant bacteria and prevent the spread of infections, strengthen national One Health surveillance efforts to combat resistance, and that'll be the focus of our uh, discussion today advanced development and use of rapid and innovative diagnostic tests, accelerate basic and applied research to develop new drugs, therapeutics, and vaccines, and then improve international collaboration and capacity for control, surveillance, and research. And so these are the five main prongs of our national strategy. And, and what I wanna to talk to you about today is, is what we're doing in terms of national One Health surveillance efforts to combat resistance and how we're incorporating into that the latest genomics technologies uh, to make those data um, more valuable and 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 give us a better understanding of the nature of the hazards uh, in um, a One Health surveillance programs in terms of resistance. So let me um, def define our terms then a little bit further there. So One Health surveillance is sort of a new description, if you will, for what we used to call integrated surveillance of antimicrobial resistance, and this refers to foodborne bacteria specifically. And it's integrated in the sense that it involves the coordinated sampling and testing of bacteria from food animals, from foods derived from those animals, and from clinically ill humans. And then the subsequent evaluation of resistance trends throughout the food animal production and supply chain using harmonized methods. And that's a definition right from the WHO's advisory group on integrated surveillance of antimicrobial resistance. Now, the One Health twist to this definition is, is to include the environment. And so the One Health triad is that healthy people, healthy animals, and healthy environments are all co-linked. And to keep them that way requires interdisciplinary approaches um, from the scientific community. This includes everything from ecologists and epidemiologists to molecular biologists and economists. And so it is to take a broader perspective on what health means in, 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 um, in terms of ecosystems. So the way this is functions, this, this type of integrated or One Health surveillance system functions, it's designed primarily to understand and contain antibiotic resistance arising in, uh, on the farm, if you will, in food animal production, and to try to quantify how much of that resistance moves through the food supply and the burden of resistant infections it places on the human population. And so a surveillance system that does this well does first go out and get baseline information on what is the level of the nature and the magnitude of resistance in the major commodities that are part of the local economy. And so in the United States, that's mainly beef, pork, chicken, and turkey, and, and then seafood, I think you would add to that, as the major protein sources derived from production units where antibiotics are used. And so that baseline information that you get, and I'll tell you how we do that in a moment, is used to understand how things change over time. And that's a real key feature is, are things getting better? Are they getting worse? Can we measure um, trends and put some uh, solid um, analysis behind those trends to determine when a problem has become 
when when this issue of resistance, which is a natural biological phenomenon, is evolving into a, a medical problem that re requires more urgent attention. Uh, another part of what this, a good surveillance system can do is attribution. Can we tell, for example, in a case of human foodborne illness, if we have just the bacterial isolate in our hand, can we tell if, say, the food supply is absent or the patient doesn't remember what they ate? Could we characterize that organism in a way to know, to attribute it to its animal source and, and um, use that information to mitigate the problem? And then the next part of this wheel, if, and I'm going around this wheel here in the middle of the slide after attribution is how do we understand antimicrobial use and its relationship to resistance? And it's not always straightforward. In some cases, it can be very straightforward and you can see rather direct relationships for some drugs and some bacteria, but it's, it's a complex issue and it's very different from one organism to another. But uh, a good system, a good surveillance system that can achieve this would have good use data as well as good resistance data, and that's a very difficult data set to uh, to get get a hold of. And, and many countries are struggling with that even now. But we continue, the United States, through our national plan to try to find optimal ways to get that information, so so we can understand and refine the best practices, even while we may be looking for alternatives to antimicrobials. And then, as I mentioned, the final. The final part of this wheel is the burden of illness, and, and can we tell from the human isolates that we're sampling in this integrated fashion what is escaping through from the farm through the food supply or the environment and reaching humans? And so that's essentially um, how the program works. And in the United States, this program is called the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System, and it is integrated to incorporate those three major categories of, of um, of bacteria are those three major categories of source from which we collect bacteria and monitor antibiotic resistance. And in our partnership with, uh, in this partnership, it, it consists of the Centers for Disease Control, the Food and Drug Administration, Center for Veterinary Medicine, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And what we, what we do is we collect the same, essentially the same bacteria, and we're focused mainly on the most uh, uh, epidemiologically important bacteria for foodborne illness, and that's Salmonella and Campylobacter. Uh, and so all of those two organisms are isolated from the human population, from retail meat program, uh, retail meat surveillance, and from food animals that are presented for slaughter at processing plants. Uh, we put these data together, and they, the data sets get fairly complicated, but we put these data together in a way that, we, that tries to make sense of the relationship I just described in between drug use on the farm or resistance arising on the farm and moving through the food supply. And you can see from the sampling design here, which is in a very um, very much an outline form, that, that on the food animal side that USDA um, sampling in, entails, it, it includes, as I mentioned before, broiler chickens, turkeys, swine and cattle. And then on the FDA sampling part of this surveillance system, we have the corresponding derived meats. And then CDC is looking at clinical cases from around the country. And so that we've been at this since 1996. So NARMS is a fairly mature program. It has a great deal of data. It's collected uh, isolate level information on several hundred, couple hundred thousand organisms uh, and publishes this together in annual reports um, online, which um, I would invite you to, to explore if you're interested in um, the substance of the program and, and some of the conclusions that it has drawn over the years, as well as some of the impacts that interventions, designed interventions have made on trends in resistance. Now, I show a little bit of history here because for those of you who are uh, in the public health arena and are, and especially are maybe grappling with this problem, but in general, just trying to set up systems to measure uh, hazards in to human health in, in any environment, um, what we learned in the evolution of this program is that uh, it's often best and maybe only possible to begin with ever, whatever pre-existing infrastructure might be at hand. And so what this slide shows is the history of NARM sampling at CDC since it began in 1996. And I mentioned mainly Campylobacter and non-typhoidal Salmonella are target organisms, but other bacteria are included in the program at CDC especially. And this just shows how you know, they began, for example, with non-typhoidal salmonella in 96, getting every 10th isolate from, I think, 14 states. 
and currently they get every 20th isolate from all 50 states. So the program has expanded over time as resources were available, it expanded over and improved over time in partnership with other programs. And so um, that's been one part of its success is this ability to, to, to sort of take advantage of the art of the possible, if you will, in seeking new partnerships and, um, and taking advantage of other public health infrastructures. The USDA, um, part of it that is looking at uh, the isolates from animals, um, began when NARMS began in 97, actually, using the HACCP program. Now, HACCP, as you all surely know, is part of the surveillance system that the Food Safety Inspection Service uses to ensure the hygienic quality of plants where animals are processed. So it's a, it's a sampling program where they get environmental and uh, samples and samples from animals and look for the presence of salmonella mainly. And so the old, we relied on the HACCP system for many years, but in 2013, late 2013, we set up a new system where we got individual animal samples from animals arriving at slaughter. And you can see in the new system, these are collected from the intestinal contents. It gets all, uh, it gets four of the major NARMS target bacteria and is now a nationally representative randomized sampling of our food supply. And that's that's no small achievement. That's We have a very large production system in the United States. And to achieve this on, on the scale of US ag has is, is been a real improvement to NARMS. And, and the USDA has been instrumental in making this happen and showing how you know these type the partnerships between the agencies has been so important. And then just really quickly, on the food side, this is the third component. Again, it began in this part began in 2002 with just five states, and in 2018 we're in 20 states now. And the map shows, you know, the, the recent additions. And there's a lot on this slide, but it shows our basic approach, where we're partnering with states to go out every month and purchase retail meats, chicken, turkey, beef, and pork at grocery stores, bring them to the lab, and isolate the bacteria we're interested in 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 our national resistance monitoring system. And and this just shows since 2016, we've nearly tripled the number of samples that we test every year around 19,200 in 2018. And I mentioned Salmonella and Campylobacter are the main target pathogens, but we also include E. coli and Enterococcus and it's test, that testing is done in a subset of the retail meat states. It's done in all of the animal testing. And that gives us good information on antibiotic resistance to agents that have activity against gram-positive organisms, as well as having a uh, more ubiquitous organism like E. coli that we recover from samples more frequently than Salmonella, and so we don't lose um, we don't lose resistance data in those Salmonella negative samples, if you will. So um, that's how the program stands today, essentially, and it's collecting a lot of isolates and. Um, and they're getting characterized essentially using the same methods. I mentioned that the harmonization part is key. So we're using the same antimicrobial susceptibility testing methods, which is broth microdilution methods. That means that we get the minimum inhibitory concentration of antibiotic that inhibits the strain. That's the sort of standard uh, clinical approach to susceptibility, in vitro susceptibility testing, quantitative susceptibility testing. So we're trying to, we, we use the same drug panels from the same manufacturer that goes to all the agencies doing the testing. So we're really, uh, in, and we have all the quality control in place to make sure that the data are comparable. And we rely on external quality assurance to make sure the data are comparable. And we have done this for quite a few years using standard methods that have been common to microbiology for 90 years, I suppose which is to take the meat sample, isolate the bacteria that we're interested in, and then characterize them to different levels of analysis based on, on technology that is uh, affordable and gives the sort of resolution of strain characteristics that help us understand that, that wheel I showed you at the start, you know, the baselines and how things are spreading and, and, how we, and how can we attribute things to different sources and that in classical microbiological terms has been, you know, isolating in pure culture, um, doing biochemical tests, the sort of you are what you eat kind of identification system, looking at strain types through serotyping or PFGE, um, and then um, presenting this in an aggregated fashion showing, you know, where the main serotypes are coming from by commodity and how resistance levels are changing over time. And, and by resistance levels, I mean, of the particular MIC for that drug and that bacteria combination. That's generally what we've reported. 
and, and just the phenotypic data. And then later, typically, if we had uh, the resources and time, we'd go back and do research studies to see what the genes were, or maybe do more refined typing with phage typing or MLST, or look for virulence factors in certain serotypes, and, and then try to get those reports out in peer-reviewed literature, which was usually much later than, than the samples were collected. And so um, it, it made the it made those sorts of data uh, perhaps less valuable just because of the delay in be, being able to generate the information. And this is a typical image of how we report data in our national surveillance in the NARMS program at, at the isolate level. And this shows the two enzyme PFGE pro patterns on the left, black boxes for all the drugs uh, where resistance was detected, and then some metadata around the sample, including when, it, when and where it was collected and serotype and so on. And so that has been NARMS for many years and um, and how our data have been reported for many years. And, and it's changing now dramatically with the advent of affordable whole genome sequencing. And that's what I'd like to spend the rest of my time touching on is how that data set has really transformed uh, how our surveillance is done and the, the level of detail that's been added to um, the information set that we now have, the gene, adding genotype to phenotype. You know, we, if you think about it, we've gone from 16 antibiotics on um, tested against a strain to extracting from it the 3 million base pairs of DNA. And so we're trying to find ways to combine this comprehensive genetic information with this somewhat limited but fairly good phenotypic uh, resistance data. And so uh, when we first got deeply in, involved in sequencing. We started it in, in 2006, but it didn't really become affordable till around 2011, 12, when we started more and more just sequencing our isolates on a routine basis. Uh, we and others set out to look at what the genomic processes could supplant in classical microbiology, such as can we extract serotype from the genome? Can we supplant PFGE with other strain typing methods based on DNA sequence, which obviously one can. Um, can we, what can we learn about susceptibility from the genetic data all by itself, right? And, and what can that add to our phenotype data? And the rest of uh, the advantages of sequencing are fairly obvious. You know, the piecemeal PCR experiments to look for genes or virulence profiles or other molecular markers are now built into the, into the um, laboratory process, this single laboratory method. So you get all of that automatically when you do the genome. And so it's really changed, and it's changed the type of information we have and has allowed us to drape the data in different categories um, of traits that are making, the, uh, making us able to be much more targeted in our response to growing resistance problems. And I hope to um, demonstrate that here in a moment. And so, um, my next slide. So this is just a schematic of the same thing. So um, can we go from susceptibility testing to the genetic susceptibility testing? And on top of that, can we circumvent classical microbiology altogether with metagenomic samples of resistance surveillance, uh, you know, which is to characterize the entire DNA content of a complex biological sample, like a food animal intestine or like a food product, and get the resistance genes that way? And how, how can we put that into our processes for assessing risks in the drug use environment. And to make um, several stories short, it works incredibly well. Uh, we did studies on the major target organisms in NARMS to show that phenotype, that you can uh, predict resistance in strains very accurately based on the presence of known resistance genes. And so these are just some papers showing where we've done those studies for Salmonella, Campylobacter, E. coli, and Enterococcus, and we continue to work on these. But um, I summarized some of the studies in this slide. That includes the ones I just showed you, but others are doing this as well. It works very well for many bacteria. It works very well for mycobacteria, pneumococcus, Staph aureus, and this shows the correlation between the uh, antibiotic resist, clinical resistance, and the presence of known genes for these different pathogens is you know, 95 to 100% in most cases. In other words, genotypic susceptibility testing for predicting resistance is at least as good as phenotypic testing. So that was a little bit surprising um, to some of us. So 
Now the question is, well, what does that mean for how we've always interpreted laboratory data? And there's different ways in which bacteria are characterized as being resistant. In the United States, the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, CLSI, has a rather um, rich definition of resistance. And they say it implies that isolates are not inhibited by the usually achievable concentrations of the agent with normal dosage schedules and, and or demonstrate zone diameters that fall in the range where re resistant mechanisms are likely and clinical efficacy has not been reliably shown. So it's a combination of various data sets before they wanna categorize something as resistant or susceptible or intermediate as the other categories. The European Union Committee for Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing uses a term called epidemiological cutoff values, which says resistant is whatever's not wild type. So if it's outside the, the distribution of susceptible of the susceptible population, it, it's categorized as resistant. Now they have some variations on that. What we've learned from the sequencing data is that it seems reasonable to propose another definition, which we've termed genotypic cutoff values. And Greg Tyson in our group has been working on this. And we've defined this as the highest MIC of the population of bacteria lacking resistant determinants to a given drug. So it's sort of the genotypic wild type distinction. Uh, and it has caused us in a way to sort of look at the gene as the hazard, if you will. We're, we're more focused on the underlying causes of resistance rather than uh, just the phenotypic testing and the variability that goes with that. So does this, this shows a, just a very basic schematic of how you would determine a, uh, a cutoff value based on genomics. And you can see uh, on the top left of this table, the wild type distribution and shown in green bars in the histogram. And then uh, in this case for quinolone resistance, the presence of mutations or QNR genes. And then so in this case, you would set the genotypic cutoff value um, right here at 0.06, right? That highest MIC where the lack acquired traits. And this does help us understand now data and, and help hopefully resolve some of the differences and, and, and maybe get closer to harmonizing the ways we interpret this information internationally. And so this table just shows where for the drugs on our NARMS panel, the differences between the CLSI and the UCAS or the absence of breakpoints in some cases can be, the gaps can sort of be filled in now with the GCVs based on the genomic data alone. So we've learned that sequencing predicts resistance very well, that it, it helps us refine our categorization and, and it adds even more than that. And, and so uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about that next. So now we thought, well, okay, we can predict resistance. Can we predict the actual MIC if it's, you know, point or if it's one, two, four, eight in this serial dilution, instead of whether or not it's just has hit this threshold to categorize it as resistant. And the answer to that is, is um, seems to be yes, or at least in our preliminary studies, they're very promising. And this is a, a collaboration we did with colleagues um, at Argonne National Labs and the University of Chicago, Jim Davis's lab. And this is up on the web at, today in its uh, preprint form, and there's the Q, the Q our code here if you want to read it. But this essentially, in this study, we took 5,000 of our sequenced isolates where we had phenotype data, to uh, susceptibility data, 16 antibiotics, and basically used it an XG boost uh, machine learning model to try to see if we could find signature sequences associated specifically, so associated with specific MICs within a one twofold dilution, which is the error range even in phenotypic testing. And um, the answer is, it works just as well to predict any MIC as it does to predict the resistant breakpoint. And so um, I highlighted in blue, maybe the upshot of this study is these models, uh, machine learning models are capable of predicting susceptible and resistant MICs with no a priori information about the underlying gene content of the genomes. It's stable over time, even as the trend lines change and can be done with fairly small number of sequenced uh, bacteria. And so, um, this work's ongoing. I don't know. We don't know yet how far this will be able. We'll be able to take this if if the goal is to, you know, move towards maybe one method. Um, it's going to have to be useful to the clinician who wants um, to know MIC sometimes. So that ongoing work is is promising, but there's much still to be done. So. <clears throat> That, I, I, I've tried to show you how we see genomics changing our historical way of doing surveillance, but 
you know, there's other things about it that are going to be fairly obvious to you, but that are also really powerful in trying to characterize hazards, resistant hazards in the food supply. And the, the first part harkens back to my earlier slide where I said, you know, that we automatically now in one laboratory workflow get the genetic content of an organism, basically the highest structural resolution of individuating traits you can get from an organism is its sequence of nucleotides. And so with that, we can get down to the details of recombination involved in the accumulation of resistance on different mobile DNA elements, how they interact with virulence and serotype factors and so on. And I just want to give you a couple examples of, of work like that that's come out of our NARMS laboratories. And the first one, this goes back uh, to 2007, where um, we did a sequencing project of salmonella and found um, a multidrug resistant plasma, this Inc. AC2 plasma shown on the left hand side, which is identical to a strain uh, of Yersinia pestis that was um, recovered from a child in Madagascar in 1997, 10 years earlier, who had the plague. And I, that by itself to me illustrates this one health notion as a global one health notion. You know, this, these things do. Uh, spread far and wide and quickly um, if you base it on the sensitivity and the genetic analysis. And in this case, this backbone plasmid was 99% identical with um, this Yersinia pestis plasmid and plasmids widespread in the United States food supply and infecting humans. And you can see around the border of this, the different accumulated resistance islands. And, you know, it's almost, I tell people, it's like an archaeological dig on the history of antibiotic development. And it starts with sulfonamide resistance in the backbone, the Sol2 gene. And you can go around the outer rim, and this is the Salmonella Newport strain from our sequencing, and see fluorophenicol and tetracycline resistance and streptomycin resistance, and then various aminoglycosides and quaternary ammonia compounds, sulfonamides, mercury, all piled up in this plasmid. And in the bottom right, you see something that's really interesting to me is the Blossium Y2 gene, which gives ceftriaxone resistance, very important antibiotic. And next to that, a gene for um, a, a gene called SUGI1, which gives resistance to products used in the processing plant to, to decontaminate carcasses. And so you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about how antibiotic use drives resistance patterns in our food supply, but maybe it's also processes in the plant. And so this idea of getting at new associations that might be driving resistance is a real eye opener when you're trying to design targeted mitigation strategies. On the right hand side is a study we did where uh, we essentially found a spike in genomycin resistant campy and and found eight different genomycin resistance genes, six which had never been seen before in Campy, and which we would have never seen by PCR. And so um, it's just given us the details that we didn't have before on what's driving resistance. Another great example of how genomics is transforming surveillance and helping us combat resistant bacteria is, you know, it's a portable, um, permanent, an interpretable data set. And so what that means is you can go back in time when a new emergence, a new resistant gene emerges and see if you have it in your country or your area or your hospital. And so a good example of that was the MCR1 gene, which came um, was first reported in China in 2015. And right away, people around the world scrambled into their freezers and into their databases. And, and at the time, we had 155,000 bacterial genomes that we screened and could say that that gene had not made it to the U.S., and so we could inform the practitioner community about that fact, and, and that's very valuable and data that you can now get quickly that we couldn't have gotten before. So that's a major step forward, and it only gets better with time, right? Um, another example uh, from NARMS uh, where the genomic data is, has helped in us understand the phenotypic trends was um, a case where Salmonella Dublin from humans and cattle was showing increased resistance to ceftriax and a decreased susceptibility to ciprofloxacin. And um, it was a problem. It's a, this is a, a, a serotype that is common in cattle and causes um, disease in cattle and a burden to the industry. It's fairly rare in humans, but it's very virulent in humans. And and now we can see more why that's the case on a routine basis. And this is a schematic of the sequencing from these strains showing that there are 15 different pathogenicity islands in Salmonella Dublin. 
Some are some of the pathogenicity genes are piled up on recombined plasmids that are also have antibiotic resistance genes on them. And so you can see in the genetics a reflection of the pathogenesis, uh, um, pathogenic processes in infected patients. And I, I think people are looking to this as to give sort of more refined hazard analysis, if you will, more refined um, approach to the types of, of the subtypes of organisms from different environments. And, and there's a lot of work going on right now between the NARMS partners and, and NIH to try to um, refine these categories of virulence gene content and plasmid types and so on to, so that this type of more refined work can be done. Let me move on. I mentioned metagenomics a little bit. Um, metagenomics is essentially is to uh, the process of determining the DNA sequence of a complex biological sample without, usually without culturing. Some people, there are some modifications to the different approaches, but basic question is how do we get beyond the four bacteria that we target in NARMS to get to the entire resistome? And the way to do that is to get to the entire metagenome where you can. And, and we have taken this nationally representative randomized um, surveillance of the food animal supply in the United States and have kept for the last few years every one of those samples. And we are reducing them down to their DNA constituents. And to the extent that we can, determining how, um, de determining the different resistance profiles associated with different food animal types. And so this work's being done by Daniel Tedesi and in our labs at CVM uh, for the NARMS purposes. And um, we're starting to make progress where we can, you know, associate certain genes with certain specific animal origins. So that that's gonna, a lot of people see that as, you know, the next phase in genomic sur sur surveillance um, for infectious diseases. Um, moving on quickly here, I just wanna say, so we each year NARMS produces a lot of data and we've added to it a lot more data. We currently have, uh, salmonella uh, from 12 different sources, which we compare to those from humans. And, there's, and, and we grapple with how to put all this together in a comprehensive way that includes the genomic information. And, and I'd invite you again to, you know, Google NARMS integrated report if you like to go and see our latest attempts to do this. And this is ongoing work, but we're starting to weave the genetic data now into the phenotypic data. And then as, it's best we can get this up to more real-time reporting. And that, that's our goal. Our goal is that we would have within a matter of weeks at the most from primary isolation to sequence in the public domain uh, for sharing globally with, with people and, and to try to create something like a weather map of resistance, if you will, in, in, a, in a One Health framework. Um, and so at this point, I'm gonna just go through a couple screenshots of some slides just to show very basic ways in which we've done this um, so far in NARMS. And, and as I said, I would invite you to go look on your own to see how much of it's valuable and, and frankly, to give us feedback. But we've started to add to the phenotypic timelines as shown in this slide, um, the gene, how the genes change over time. And it's a little bit difficult to see this in screenshots, but if you go online, uh, you can, you can uh, you can mouse over these different data points and um, and get a better feel for um, the information. And that's just in the NARMS reports. We've since we know we can predict resistance from the genome, we can apply um, resistance genotype to any strain deposited in the NCBI database. And we've started to do that as well. And so. Um, now we don't really have to have phenotype to make really sound decisions and conclusions about the nature of resistance and isolates from different sources. And so we've developed a tool, Heather Tate has, has put, it, um, put this up on the web. We've developed a tool called Resistome Tracker, which right now has Salmonella Campylobacter and E. coli in it, the, uh, the NARMS bacteria, but it essentially allows you to start with resistance. If you're interested in resistance, say in the case of beta-lactam resistance, and you can go and look at isolates from the US and non-US sources, and we're gonna make this better, but you can pick any gene you like in the top right here once you've selected a phenotype that you're interested in. And you can go and see, if you've seen this gene, say for the first time in your country, you can now go in here and say, well, who else has seen it and how far has it spread? and um, where might I expect it to be coming from if it's entered into our um, area here? And I'm trying to find 
pick one here, Bloss CMY, and um, and drill down. And and I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because I don't have much time. And I and it, but it, it's really very powerful how um, we can now, in as much as we can share data, we can share vital information on the on traits that are of public health importance. And we've set this up so that if you drill down to a resistance gene, say, for example, that you're interested in or an isolate, you can click uh, on the isolate and go right to NCBI's pathogen detection portal, where we sort of hand off um, the whole process to NCBI, and, or let me, maybe I should say it this way, the resistome tracker sits on top of the NCBI data, and so you can, through the strain you're interested in, go to the tools at NCBI and see where it fits on the phylogenetic tree with an NCBI. And so you can see if your sample there or your isolate that you've just picked up in your surveillance system has been, that has been sequenced and uploaded, how it aligns with other products like pet food or an environmental sample from HACCP or any of, of a number of things. And then attended to that, all the other NCBI tools at your disposal uh, within, within the, uh, that website. And then lastly, very quickly, uh, we're trying to make it more valuable by refining the categories um, in the metadata. The metadata can be quite complex at NCBI, as you know, and we're reliant on what other people submit, but there's work going on to to refine these and so that you can you can look at specific genes by general category and do the same sorts of drilling down into source and uh, time of appearance and things of that nature. Um, so that you can have whatever context is available in the national repositories of genetic information to help you understand any emergent resistant problem um, related to the food agricultural chain. So um, I know that's a kind of a quick flyover of, of some of the online tools. Um, they're much more interesting to interact with live, uh, much more interesting than the slides. And I, as I said, I would encourage you to go there and see uh, and give us feedback on, on how we might do what we do better and make this information uh, more valuable to more people. One way we're trying to do that in the NARMS program is, uh, is a, through a commitment to open and transparent and public data sharing. And we do that through a, a tool we call NARMS Now. And it's, um, it's basically the repository of all of our isolate level data, nearly 200,000 entries of isolate level data for Salmonella, Campylobacter, and E. coli, and Enterococcus collected since 1996. I mentioned Salmonella from all the different food sources. It has extensive metadata, uh, including MICs to 16 antibiotics. The whole genome sequencing data is going up on into NCBI. We're trying to link it to our NARMS now spreadsheet so you can download the entire program essentially and uh, take advantage of the data for your own research or public health purposes. And as I mentioned before, the goal is to make this as real time as possible uh, as, as soon as we can. And we hope we can do that in the 2018-2019 year uh, time period. So that's a lot and a little bit of a time and, and I really didn't entirely do justice to every element I wanted to try and cover today, but I wanted to wrap up with maybe a few general thoughts and some thoughts about the future and how genomics is making um, One Health surveillance um, a more realistic approach to, to um, infectious disease and combating resistant bacteria. Um, I say in here, one health, one method. I mean, we're not there yet, but the promise of genomics is 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 really encouraging, and the technique technology is very powerful and has become very affordable. And and uh, some of the new technology on the horizon is really quite astonishing. And I think it's going to very very rapidly continue to become a routine laboratory process uh, in in clinics and hospitals and public health agencies worldwide. As I mentioned before, the main advantage it gives you is the highest practical re resolution of individuating structural traits you can get from an organism. I think that's safe to say. Um, and members of an ecosystem if you're looking at metagenomics. We've demonstrated that it's an accurate prediction of clinical resistance and perhaps MIC, at least in Salmonella so far, and another study on Klebsiella, I think, showing the same ability to predict MIC. It reveals resistance to compounds we've not historically tested, such as disinfectants and heavy metals and other potential drivers of resistance, which, which our efforts are incomplete if we, don't, if we don't have all that knowledge. 
It allows deep surveillance into previously hidden associations, such as co-resistance with plasmids and virulence, and, and really just a cataloging all the different um, mobile DNA elements that mediate the spread of resistance has now become very automatic in our processes. Source attribution for more precise intervention. I didn't show the research we've done on that, but we've done a few preliminary studies where we've identified some surface structures uh, in typhimerium that seem to be specific for the animal source, even though the serotype is not. So we continue to work on that. Very powerfully, it gives retrospective resistance surveillance. Metagenomics are developing to allow us to escape limitations on whole genome and get us to metagenomic surveillance. And because of the dropping costs and the fact that you don't have to buy two enzymes for PFGE and run PFGE uh, instrumentation and all the expense and specialized reagents and instrumentation that went with the old uh, classical approach, this should free up resources to, to look farther and fewer with uh, into environments like wild animal populations. Look at animal feed and its role and pet foods and uh, other sources, companion animals and other exposure pathways, including a refined uh, sampling design for environmental testing. Taken together, this um, should give us a much clearer picture of the global resistance emergence and spread and greater confidence in our public health decision making. And a colleague of mine, Eric Brown at FDA, likes to show this comparison of what the transition in technology is meant to our understanding. And, and he uses the, the staring at the night sky as an as a analogy where we've gone from pathogen plating as a sort of stargazing to the biochemical speciation followed by phenotypic subtyping and then genotypic subtyping. And now the Hubble telescope, which gives us this high resolution of genomics and and has really made um, the data set so much more valuable. Well, so where do we go from here if we have this technology? And I mentioned some of this, but a One Health framework ought to be looking at food animal pathogens and not just the zoonotic bacteria that are reaching humans through the food supply, because we want healthy animals, obviously, as, as well as healthy people for a, a, a healthy environment. Uh, can we look on farm to get a better understanding of the what's changing over time in specific drug use environments is companion animal surveillance what what you know we don't fully understand the contribution of resistance that comes from our pets but we do understand that we share their microbiome and quite rapidly once we bring a new pet home so there there's uh, reasonable grounds for looking there uh, in, in in our pets where antibiotics are also used in and, and um, all antibiotics essentially are, are used in pets. So that's an important element. Um, I mentioned to continue to develop microbiome methods, but we need to also in all of this process as things are changing so rapidly is work in partnership across uh, federal, state, uh, research laboratories, universities, all those with a common interest in infectious diseases, frankly, um, and to try to find out ways where the data sharing processes are optimal in our interpretation of them. Uh, result in a common language for a common approach to combating resistance. Uh, it's, impo it's, it's not possible to, to acknowledge everybody in the program, but NARMS is a large program with a lot of dedicated people in all 50 states at, and, and at CDC, USDA, and FDA, and some of them are mentioned here. And um, uh, I just want to wrap up by saying that, you know, working with NCBI to incorporate the genomics part and with, with our colleagues at FDA CIFSAN is really pushing arms forward and we continue to try to exploit these genomics technologies to make this program as consequential and meet our mission to protect public health at FDA and USDA and at CDC. And with that, I thank you for tuning in today. Um, I hope this has um, been interesting to most of you perhaps and um, and the data set in the public domain at, at least is there for your um, perusal and exploitation and, and uh, we'll continue to try to keep putting data out there for um, everyone to take advantage of and um, and to use for um, public health purposes and with that i thank you very much Thank you, Dr. McDermott, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. Let's get started. Our first question is, 
How will whole genome sequencing change the surveillance design? That's a good question. And that's something that we are grappling with and many others are grappling with. And we are working with our, our counterparts in the European Union right now in those discussions, because if you can predict from the genome um, the presence of known genes with a great degree of certainty and confidence, um, what type of phenotyping ought we be doing then? How, how, how should we be doing it differently? And I can give you a quick example. So we have streptomycin um, on our antibiotic surveillance plate for salmonella. It's not a drug used to treat salmonella, but it, it had been incorporated historically because it serves as a, a good marker for a resistance pattern that was associated with a specific strain type of salmonella called DT-104. And so it had resistance to five drugs, including streptomycin. So it was there as a, a marker to help pre-screen for that strain. Well, if you can glean that from the genome, we don't need to do that phenotypic testing in all likelihood. So that, that raises a lot of possibilities. We have limited real estate on this phenotyping panel for MIC testing. So we're talking about new drugs to put on there, like colistin. Even, uh, um, even though we hadn't seen the mobile gene, we should be looking for it and to put more advanced antibiotics on there. But I expect it will evolve over time, depending on how the studies play out on predicting MIC, it will evolve over time. And we haven't really come to terms with what it'll look like a few years from now, but um, we hope to work it out in lockstep with our counterparts in the EU, as I mentioned, so that we have data we can compare them and um, no gaps in the data. So in our discussions, we can understand the resistance situation in our, in our different geographical regions. So it's a, it's a good question and a hard question and one that's hard to predict, but it surely will impact um, how we've done things historically in terms of MIC testing. Thank you for that. Next one is you mentioned the NARMS Now website where all the NARMS isolate level data are made public. Are other countries making similar data public so comparisons can be made? That's a very good question. And that's a complicated one. So um, there's there, there are laws in different countries that preclude some of that data sharing. And in fact, in the United States too. So it's, it can be state level differences in what type of types of data uh, from a patient can be put in the public domain. And so some countries have laws against it that preclude them from doing so. Um, and it, some of them are being readdressed in terms of the antibiotic resistance challenge to see, you know, if there are ways that public, that privacy can be protected and still data can be shared. Um, so it, it's a complicated problem because it, it, there are legal issues tangled up with it. but. To the extent possible, I, I think everyone wants to put that information out there so that we can all have the same weather map of resistance, if you will, so that we can all have our eyes on the same hazards and work in a coordinated fashion to try try to deal with them. So um, that that's gonna it's gonna take some time to to um, expand the number of countries who are able to share data in real time in the public domain, but I think that the, the trend is towards that sort of openness. So that's a very welcome thing. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Given that the technology has become affordable and widespread so quickly, what do you see happening in the next few years? Yes, well, I think in terms of infectious disease science, which is what we're focused on here, I mean, not even to mention just genomics of individuals and, and the rapid progress there, that's really quite astonishing. That, you know, they're talking of having an app on your phone that has your genome when you go to your doctor. I mean, that, those sorts of things are remarkable in and of themselves. I think in terms of um, infectious disease science and the use of genomics, I, I really do see very quickly that it will become a desktop instrument um, like so many desktop instruments in a, in a hospital lab or in a physician's office um, that will pluck out of that, the um, pathogenic organism, the essential information for the physician to apply proper treatment and for public health officials to say interrupt an outbreak if there's one going on. So I see rapid real time um, diagnostics coming out of this that are going to greatly accelerate um, patient care. One of the challenges with it is though, how, how do we keep the data, right? Sometimes these instruments have, um, you know, sort of the, done with the sample and, and throw away the information of the data. So I know some people are concerned about warehousing this information as a public health good 
but the, but it's going to be generate it's going to continue to accelerate um, in the pace at which it's being generated and and trying to grapple with the information is as big a challenge as generating it. But I, I think it's just uh, go, we're going to see it become a routine, common thing that um, it's going to become that has already become very affordable and and it's becoming a data management issue as much as anything at this point. So I, I think that the trajectory is very positive in terms of um, availability, the technology being available and widespread, and that's that's always that's only a good thing because of the amount of information you glean from the technique. Thank you for that. I would like to once again thank Dr. McDermott for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 13th, 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye.